So it's a little early, but I figured it'd be nice to just go ahead and start, um, just to chat a bit, let folks get into the stream. So, um, <clears throat> excuse me, let me have some iced coffee. Always prepared with my iced coffee. Oh, I've got a new camera now, it's up there. Hopefully everyone can see and hear me. If you can, maybe just send me a little note. Uh, oui, je parle français, je parle un petit peu français. Je te dis... Uh, 13, 13 mois à la Alliance Française en Nouvelle-Zélande. Pour plaisir. Tu es française? Ah. Bien. Merci. Je dois, euh, je dois la langue euh, française. Euh, euh, mm, Désolé, ma français n'est pas bien. Euh, mon préféré écrivain sont français. Par exemple, Rimbaud, Baudelaire, euh, l'autre allemand. Euh... Ah! J'ai visité euh, Paris euh, dernière année. Euh, J'ai visité euh, chaque année. Uh, dans l'hiver, l'hiver, in the winter. Merci. Thank you, Mac. Mac Black. Mike Black Studio. Thank you. Thanks so much. Oh, merci, merci. <laughs> je parle avec difficulté, mais je lis français chaque soir. Par exemple, uh, un BD. Je dois le BD de uh, Fantastique. Uh, uh, le, uh, le horror uh, BD. Uh, something of Spanish. Um, let me think. You know, I have no excuse for not having better Spanish because it's like the, like I always say, it's like, like when you grow up in America, it's different than growing up in Europe um, where you, you've got exposure to so much media in English if English isn't your first language. Uh, and the closest thing to that in America is you, you have so much access to Spanish and I should have better Spanish. I'm trying to think. Um, Diablo. <laughs> Diablo. <laughs> El Diablo. There we go. Uh, I used to know a little bit of Portuguese. Um, yes, but I started early. Um, bu 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 bu. Thanks so much. So I'm, I'm imagining that everyone can see right now as well as here. So. <sighs> Je n'ai pas compris. Uh, Donnerai to avant. Begin. I'm sorry, I don't, I don't quite get million three. I didn't quite, I don't quite get the last one. Hello, Pakistan. So we've got, we've got three minutes till we will start proper. Oh, wow, Serbia. Hello, Serbia. Hello, Brazil. How fantastic. So many people from so many different places. So let me just pull up my outline really quick. And I always try and have things that I want to talk about planned out, even though. <clears throat> oh, OK, advice. All right. Um, I couldn't, uh, I missed two words, uh, myelin three, and uh, I didn't understand two of the words, so it threw me uh, when I was reading. Um, advice before starting the stream. Um, I think doing lots of little things, lots of little sketches in ZBrush. Get a sphere, do a sketch. 
don't get stuck in doing one thing for too long because then you can find yourself overworking mistakes that if you're just starting out, I think it's better to do lots of little things, call it, and then go to the next thing. And I think you'll learn faster and you'll learn more that way. And there's an immense value to doing, you know, long projects, of course. But I think that's a really good strategy when you're first starting out anything. If it's painting, if it's sculpting, if it's ZBrush, um, do a lot of little things. Shane Olson. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great work. Hello, Ukraine. So, all right, here we go. We're right at the start now. Um, so, hello, I'm uh, Madeline Scott Spencer. You call me Maddie. And I make monsters. I'm a creature and character designer. I am a, uh, an instructor, educator, and author. And um, this is my website, maddiemonster.com. I'm just going to say that if you want to keep up with me and, and connect, I'm pretty, pretty accessible. You can find me across most social media that's here. <clears throat> Um, you'll find my gallery uh, at maddiemonster.com, which is my art station. Um, you'll also find uh, my blog, which I'd recommend that you, you go check out my blog and maybe um, follow it, because there might be things on there that are useful uh, for you. I put up uh, things like, you know, if I'm doing a new event, I'll put that up. Or um, I do a stream, or excuse me, I do a series uh, called Maddie Monster's Library, which... Um, it is pretty neat. I'll just basically grab one of my favorite anatomy books off any of the myriad shelves that are around my my house. Uh, something that's that's been really valuable for me. Uh, and then I'll write a little blog post about it, put a link to it, and then show images of, of, of from the book and what is so great about the book. So this was my last one, which was on Goldfinger's Atlas of Anatomy, which I have always said is kind of the best contemporary anatomy book. Um, it was hugely helpful for me. Oh, thank you. Um, Ace and Creatures, thank you for that. Thanks so much. I appreciate that. Um, so it's the most useful contemporary anatomy book, in, in my opinion. Um, and if you go to my website, go to maddiemonster.com, go to my blog, you can read through what I've written about it. You can see other images from it. And you can actually just click the images, and it'll take you right to the Amazon page for the book. There's also Peck's Atlas of Anatomy in there. There's a few, and I've got other ones coming up. Um, that I just like to sort of share because I, I, I bought a lot of books and read a lot of books over the years. And there's some that just stick with me and that I, I just keep. Pex, for example, um, this one here. I mean, this is probably my, my 20th copy of this book. Um, I just go through them and go through them and go through them. It's such a useful text. Um, so I just wanted to point that out, that uh, you can find me on, on maddiemonster.com, follow the blog, um, follow the art station, and friend me on Facebook, Instagram. My Instagram is maddiemonsterart, maddiemonster underscore art. Um, and also, um, you know, see announcements of anything new that I have coming out from Nomen. Because um, if you're interested in, in sort of learning more about ZBrush, uh, whatever level you happen to be, um, I have the introduction to ZBrush 2020 video series at the Nomen Workshop, which is 20 plus hours long, because <laughs> I figured if you're going to do an introduction to ZBrush, you should introduce just about everything in ZBrush, so it's 20 hours long. But it's, you know, it's broken into chapters, so you can zero in on the things that you want, and it's broken up um, into a quick start. So you start out, and we just sculpt a bust from a sphere, and then through that tutorial you learn about navigation and different things in ZBrush that you're going to need to move forward. So you can watch the quick start and then spend a few weeks doing stuff on your own and then go into the next chapters we'll talk about things like the interface. I demystify the interface because the ZBrush interface looks much more complicated than it actually is and um, things like that. So if that sort of thing interests you, check out um, my Nomen Workshop uh, videos, everybody's videos on Nomen Workshop. Um, I teach for Nomen Online. I teach two classes. I teach a creature design class and I teach uh, an introduction to ZBrush class. And there's so many great videos on the Nomen site too that you get access to in addition to, to my introduction to ZBrush. There's um, a, you know wonderful videos from Gino Acevedo on painting creatures and he's like you know a dear friend and, and mentor. Um, you get uh, I believe John Brown sculpting uh, and mold making is on there. And if you're going to be sculpting in ZBrush, it's really nice to just have some experience sculpting in clay. You don't have to do a lot of it, but I think it's really handy to put your fingers on form and make form by hand. Someone's asking um, my Instagram. My Instagram is maddiemonster underscore art. So just maddiemonster like you see on the screen in the lower left-hand corner, but then underscore art. 
No, you're not late. We just started. Tell me in French or write it to me. I think you know. Ah, ah, d'accord. Oui. Um, 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 envoy, uh, envoy, envoy, moi, on uh, communique électronique, maddie at maddiemonster.com. Uh, je réponds en français. Bien. Uh, um, I'll translate what I said. I just, it's hard for me to, because I have to, it's, I have so much sympathy or so much understanding for, you know, when, when you're talking to somebody who's not trying to communicate in their, in their original language, like the pauses and the, and you, and you panic and you lose words. Ah, bien. Merci. Merci. Um, okay, cool. All right. So, uh, let's talk a bit about, um, Darian. Um, let me bitch, switch over to my Photoshop. So we're going to talk, talk about uh, the COVID demoni, uh, which is this is the third and last of the series on this, where we're um, taking it up to this point. And this is about the point where I've gotten out of um, of key shot, and then I would take this into Photoshop and start painting over it. Um, uh, you know, n knocking some things back into shadow, bringing things th some things forward into light, and just trying to make it feel. Just bring that extra little bit in there, painting in some translucency, um, using the, the render layers and whatnot. But just to give you kind of a, an overview of where we are at this stage, because um, I did a lot of work on it sort of uh, independently. I said I was going to do it all on camera, but then I realized like talking about the process as I'm doing it would take forever. So we'd be doing these streams until, you know, well into next year. And uh, I kind of wanted to finish it before COVID was no longer a thing. <laughs> so... Um, there we go. There's 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 a uh, uh, the 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 head, um, and then sort of zooming in on the body, and you see that we've we've got the um, sort of mechanical elements that we put into the lungs there to have that sort of nasty bit of um, body horror there, and then there's some um, sort of bile or pus coming down out of that, which uh, I need to actually. You know, I need to tweak that um, that render on that because the refraction index isn't quite what it needs to be for um, uh, the sort of viscous fluid that I'm looking for. But you can get online, you can actually Google um, refraction index and you can find a list of materials and it'll actually give you the numerical values to put in for those. So it's not really very hard. And I've got another piece that, um, I mean, I always do that. I always like to put slime and stuff in things. Um, and you just see a little bit of the 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 detailing on there and then we go over to sort of gray you can see it in gray um, and put the little 19 on the forehead so that's the geometry that I'm using and that's just made with a mesh extraction I did a mesh extraction off the lungs if we have time I'll show you that uh, I textured it in poly paint um, uh, Ace and Creatures, uh, it's very bad French from me. It's very bad French, but I, I like practicing when I can. Your English is great. Mathis Magcastro, don't know, your English is fine. Um, I started, how did, how did I start this particular piece? I started it um, on camera. Uh, I, you can actually go back and watch the others in the series. Yeah, I poly painted it in ZBrush. It's just, it's just actually a very, very quick poly paint. And I'm going to talk to you about some of the customized brushes that I made to do that. Um, and then there we go. We've got a little close-up of the head. Let's rotate that. There's a little error in my video display where when I switch between documents in Photoshop, it sort of captures the, the, the previous one in the background. Books on your blog. Cool. Awesome. Mattia? All right, so going over to ZBrush now, we can see here we are. This is this is this is the state that um, I have brought COVID Demoni to, um, and then transferred over into KeyShot to do the render. So typically, I work something up. Oftentimes, I'm working under a very tight time frame, so I'll, I'll work something up. Often, from about the angle I know that I'm going to be illustrating it from. Uh, I mean, I still can't help but work the whole figure. 
and sculpt areas that won't be seen in my final presentation. But that's fine because in, in the, you know, if you're successful in that presentation of that concept, they're going to say, okay, can we see the back? Or that's great, go ahead and package that up and send that up you know, onto previs. So then you basically have to, to take your, your work you did for the concept and then turn that into, um, you know, finish off the rest of it and send it along. Um, or if it's just for an illustration, like this, I would never really intend to 3D print this or do anything like that. I, I'm basically just working mostly to the angle that I'm expecting to be uh, rendering. So, <clears throat> no, I don't stream in my own Twitch channel. Uh, I do use Mari, um, but I don't use it typically uh, for, you know, I, I'll use Mari if I have to make something that's, um, um, like going like 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 a texture for a pipeline, I would do that in Mari. But otherwise, I just paint things in Photoshop and and ZBrush. When will the twenty twelve release? I don't know. Uh, okay, cool. Um, I'm gonna go to my outline. Make sure that I don't get too far off task here. Right, so you can see if you go to the 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 the, the, the uh, Pixelogic stream channel, you can see the other videos. Um, there's a lot of there's like th this is the third one, and they're long, and it's just me going through this process. So going from, I think I started from like um, my basic skeleton that I cut apart, and then um, did some uh, insert meshes and blocked this out like with them. Um, I think I might have used IMMB parts, and then I used spheres and just balls and stuff. <clears throat> uh, yeah, I don't know anything about um, uh, 2021 um, s other than what you guys saw. Um, so, sorry, I just lost my train of thought. All right, right, right. So one of the things that, it, you know, as I was looking at this, if we compare it to where we were, this is where we last left off here. No, wait, here. No, here. And there's actually a scale difference here, which we'll talk about. So that's the last save that I had uh, during our last session together. Um, so I'd only gotten it, you know, s sort of kind of blocked in. And I was just thinking my way around some of these these shapes and these relationships here. And I use this a lot, the thumbnail view. This is really, really great. And it comes in really handy um, just to keep you thinking about your silhouette, thinking about your first read thinking about the, the, the positive and negative shapes. It used to be that I would just apply a flat color material to my Z tool so I could see the silhouette as I'm working. This is really nice because it just shows you right there on the screen. Sometimes I still do just add a flat color material or if I go to my material menu here and then select flat color, anything that doesn't have a material in the channel will just display as flat. And this can still be really useful if I want to sort of work something here in the viewport just thinking about the silhouette. In my creature class, in our first class, we do thumbnails and, and I, um, I show various different ways of thumbnailing in Photoshop and Procreate. Uh, on sticky notes, this is my favorite way of thumbnailing is sticky notes because they're disposable, they're small, you do them quick, stick it to the side, you stick them all around, put them up on a wall, pick out the best ones. I just like them because they, they sort of maintain that that very disposable, very, there's just something about working out little ideas on a sticky note that just appeals to me. But one of the things that I show is, is taking um, a sphere in ZBrush, putting a flat color material on it and just sculpting like that and not worrying about what the form is underneath, just worrying about the silhouette that you're making. <clears throat> And then when you turn shading back on, sometimes you actually end up with something really cool, a lot of happy accidents. Uh, generally, I'm always working on basic material too when it comes to materials. I'm not uh, an advocate for sculpting under these materials here, the matte cap materials. These are beautiful materials. They're really great for rendering. Uh, they're really great for um, uh, showing things. But the problem with them is you can't interactively change your lighting on them. Uh, and uh, some of them have some translucency that's sort of baked into them, like the red wax shader, for example, uh, the default material in ZBrush, I believe is red wax, and that has a certain degree of translucency. So you're not seeing your surface, you're seeing sort of into the surface a little bit. If you've ever done a maquette in Sculpey, you might have had this experience where you sculpted it, you're like, oh, this looks great, and then you bake it, and then after you bake it, you're like, ah, oh, 
it doesn't look as cool as it did like before. And that's because it becomes opaque when you bake it. There's translucency to Sculpey. And sometimes that can actually make it hard to see form in Sculpey. Usually you're working pretty small if you're working in Sculpey, so it's not that big a deal. But um, that's sort of like a similar idea as to why I don't use the matte cap materials to sculpt. Uh, I always say if somebody important's walking by, then I might change to matte cap gray because it sort of smooths out any inconsistencies and it's a real pretty shader. It's a really beautiful shader. But for myself, I'm always working on basic material too. And it's essentially a blend shader for what that matters. What's important about it is <clears throat> that it has um, a highlight, a mid-tone, and a core. It has three values in it. So I want to be able to see my form very, very clearly. Another thing as I'm working, I have a hotkey set up here and I will show you how to do this. This hotkey is uh, up here, it's Maddie Monster Lights. So I just name everything, all my custom stuff Maddie Monster so I can easily find it again, like do a hard drive search or if I share something, it's people know where it came from if it stops working. So I have that set to, to control L and this, this lets me uh, move my lighting around because when you're sculpting, I think it's always very, very important that um, a lot of the forms that you're making um, appear under different lighting conditions. Like not everything needs to be visible under all lighting conditions. As the light moves around, the, the, the shape should change. Now you notice up here I have a button called Interactive Light. And that actually comes from the ZBrush interface. If I go to Z Plugin, Miscellaneous Utilities, there's Interactive Light right there. Now I used to use this all the time. I've used this, it's been in ZBrush since 1.5B, which is when I started using ZBrush. Is the, 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 I think that was the third release of ZBrush ever. Uh, it's been in there since then. Um, I don't use it as much as I used to because, and I haven't, it hasn't happened to me in a long time, but it would, um, I've already worn down the, the point on my Wacom pen and it's only been a week. Um, it can sometimes hang my interface and that was really frustrating. That hasn't happened in a long time, but I'm par I get paranoid of stuff like that. So um, I, uh, I don't use it as much. I just use my control L hotkey. Control L, and I can move my light around here. This also allows me to very quickly turn on a secondary light. So I take the secondary light and turn it on, and I'll just move it up to the side here, and I can turn the intensity of it up and change the color. Let's make it, um, this is sort of an image about sickness. So let's pick a color that people think about, and they think about sickness, which is greens and yellows generally. I mean, color is cultural. Um, it's not always, you know, you can't say everybody in the world has the same associations with color, but that makes it really fascinating just to s also like how other colors are perceived. There's some things that are true consistently about color in terms of like the physics of color and color theory, um, but it's kind of like music theory, you know, like music theory, there's different music, there's different um, types of music theory for different cultures you know not everything is 4-4 four, four time not everything is is the the treble clef etc but I'm gonna grab this greenish hue just because it's sort of to me it's quite sickly this sort of yellowish green and um, turn that up and then I click that orange dot and put it behind the object and then I can take my key light and then I'll just set this to like a value of one and bring this up to about here and then having that rim light can really be nice for describing the form i might actually desaturate that color a little bit so if i just go back to that just to the main light menu here um i don't want that to be quite so saturated so i'll bring that down and there we go so now it's not um quite so overwhelming i have no idea what my headphones are called uh it's like a gaming headset that I got on Amazon when I was recording the ZBrush uh, tutorial. Um, I'll have to look it up in the settings later. Uh, that's why you use Keyshot materials. Well, I use Keyshot because um, it has there's the Keyshot bridge to ZBrush, and um, it's really fast and it's really really useful and um, it just gives me a really nice effect. But ZBrush also does HDR lighting. I mean, you can bring light domes into ZBrush or excuse me. Um, um, HDRI images into ZBrush and, and light with them, creating light caps. Um, we're not going to talk about that today, but that is in my Nomen series. If you want to learn about that, um, there's a whole chapter on that. And the ZBrush renderer is really powerful. I think a lot of people don't realize how much you can do with ZBrush 
um, in terms of rendering because it doesn't really always look like what they might be accustomed to. So they overlook a lot of settings because there's settings for the renderer that are under the white menu and there's settings that are going to impact your render under material. Um, like, you know, under the light menu, there's this entire light cap system that's often overlooked, which will give you really nice renders. Um, so people don't always know about that. <clears throat> you're getting a, you're getting a flickering image. Um, I'm not seeing that on my stream. If anybody else is getting that, let me know. Uh, do you pose after you finish sculpting, or do you pose and then sculpt? I pose a bit into the into the process, and then um, continue sculpting after that. You can't just pose something and say, "Oh, it's done," because as soon as the body starts moving, the forms are going to change because the the relationship between the origin and insertion of the muscles and the bones, like the clavicle, is going to move. You know, the body landmark relationships are going to change. Um, so yeah, I will always still be, I keep forgetting my camera's up there now. I will, I'll always sculpt after I pose. Cool, 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 cool. Uh, new to sculpting, then focused on just blocking out forms at the moment. <laughs> blocking out forms. Like that's, I, I spend so much time in so many of my classes telling people, think about big shapes, think about big forms. What I was saying earlier before you arrived, Brandon, is um, do lots of little sphere sculptures spend a couple hours on them or spend a day on them like just don't get stuck in them just do a bunch of them and if you do a bunch of little sphere sculptures using using dynamesh but also make sure that you understand how to use subdivision levels because subdivision levels are what allow you um, to step up and down your model and make big shape changes uh, if you can't work with a subdivision level you're stuck with you know, millions of polygons in a dynamesh but for the very very start Get yourself a sphere, dynamesh it, start pushing and pulling it around. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, Z spheres are underrated. I use Z spheres for quite a lot of things. Uh, Z spheres are really great too because they generate um, faces, edges that are all pointed in the same direction. Um, so if you were to make a snake out of Z spheres and then use an uh, insert mesh or a nano mesh brush, they're all pointing the right direction without having to do anything. So that they're they're native to ZBrush and they they work out really really nicely. So, um, where was I? All right, so comparing between the two. So some of the things that I was thinking about was the negative spaces, like looking at the distribution of the negative spaces here and here. So there's all sorts of stuff happening here. And the danger that I was running into is there might be too much happening here. And you know, I'm still not convinced that there isn't. But this was, you know, I was looking at this thing, and well, I want a real strong diagonal here. I wanted this to be asymmetrical because if we look at the, you know, the last spot where we, where I left off, I hadn't gotten around to knocking out negative spaces in there yet, and nor had I um, brought in any sort of asymmetry. And that's another thing too. Asymmetry is really nice, even though this is is one of the the pieces that I do that's sort of based around sort of um, <clears throat> Western religious iconography which has a fair bit of bilateral symmetry in it. And also because there's so many weird things happening in the chest, um, it's helpful to have it more or less head on so you can understand what's happening there. But I still wanted there to be some asymmetry here. So if you look at these negative spaces, they're quite asymmetrical. And there's a real strong diagonal here that hit, oops, ah, that hits this diagonal here leading up into the head. The head leads you down here, boom, boom that kind of curves you background. So thinking about the, the the pictorial composition, even while you're sculpting, just thinking about composition of your sculpture uh, is, is quite helpful. So I knew that I wanted there to be some, neg some negative spaces in here, and I wanted to make sure those were um, on an angle. Uh, that angle kind of like just gives me that sort of lopping, drooping kind of creepiness. I also put in the... Um, the 19, and I'll show you how I did this, the 19 on the forehead, because the, so the inspiration behind this, as I was saying in some of the earlier streams, is like this sort of regal, this regal um, sort of figure, this, um, you know, it's, it's all about inability to breathe and infectiousness and um, uh, danger. And of course, the, the shape is based around the, um, the COVID-19 uh, virus. And the, the Roman numerals are on there because Roman numerals look bitchin', don't they? I mean, seriously, it's like, you know, you put Roman numerals on something and all of a sudden it's just awesome. <laughs> uh, uh, Renit Kumar Jackson, you're confused?
uh, let me know what you're confused about, and I'll see if I can't revisit it. Um, so to the time it took to get to this stage, I mean, I don't know. You can watch it. I think I spent like six hours streaming before, and then I spent a few hours. I was super busy for the past few weeks, so I think I spent a couple. I spent maybe four or five hours last night. It's so probably 10, 16, 17 hours, something like that. About it, about probably a day. Like it feels like a full days of work, day of work if you put your stuff in and put the time together. Oh, thank you. Thanks. Yeah, that's that's that was the idea is to get um uh, to, thank you happy extruder the, to get that take that theme and carry that theme through. So there were a couple other things that changed as well. Just thinking about that theme was the the nasal cavity. So as I went further along from this this start point here, I was like, oh, that that the big gaping nasal cavity is so much of a skull and I don't need that signifier to say this there's a skull here because there's other signifiers in here like the teeth and the, and the cheekbones that you're like yeah that's a skull and also it just it it speaks so much to respiration I think it would be quite disturbing to cover that and and just that that difficulty in breathing and um it just helped the uncanniness because there's like two levels of sort of horror in this there's the uncanny which is the covered eyes and and the the pitting there, and then there's a bit of body horror down here with the exposed entrails and whatnot. Between the two, I, I tend to prefer the uncanny, um, but you can hit people over the head with the uh, the body horror as well. But the uncanniness is the thing that I find the most interesting. Um, so let's get into the head here. Come on, every time I stream, there's always a little bit of a delay on my on my tablet. There we go. So yeah, I, w I wanted to cover that nose, and I'll show you how I did that. It was just a, a, a brush that I used, just sculpting right into that to cover that nose. Um, in the previous um, streams, I talked about um, creating these protein stalks. So like the whole idea of the head is that it's based around the, the, the COVID-19 virus, and it has the little bits and bobs coming off of it, which are proteins that allow it to invade uh, other cells and inject its DNA in there. Viruses are jerks. So, um, and the halo is made of ribs. I just cut ribs out of a skeleton that I made because again, respiration and chests. And if you kind of think about that sort of stuff um, as you're working, you sort of like foster that idea, like, like think about your things as a story and think about or think them as, as a song or a poem and make things like work together and have a reason for stuff. It's it's it could be really, really nice. And you know, I quite like this this these shapes here. I like the these spiny bits coming out. Um uh contrasting with the 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 alternating curvature here and these bits curving up here, which were sort of there to suggest kind of a collar, like a high collar or some kind of very regal sort of um accoutrement. Mm -mm. Yeah, I'm about to talk uh, about scaling. Uh, Doug, no worries. Uh, Yashivi, if you if you if you go back in the stream later on, you'll see I, I recommend people go to my website, MaddieMonster.com. And at maddiemonster.com, you'll find my blog. And on my blog, you'll find Maddie Monster's library. And I post anatomy books and painting books, just art instruction books there. And the last two posts are about two of my favorite anatomy books. <clears throat> and that's a great way to learn anatomy. Um, I also did Cadaver Lab. I did um, 50 hours of Cadaver Lab, uh, two different medical schools, um, which is a little harder to get access to. But that's also another way to learn anatomy. But I would probably go into that with a bit more experience because you'll get more out of it if you know what you're looking at and you know what to go looking for. You don't want to just start peeling back skin and being like, oh, what is that? Oh, hey, was, is this important? <laughs> so, um, but it is helpful. And just, you know, looking at things and reproducing things. But also um, another thing about anatomy is don't do what I did, where I just became so obsessed with it so early on in in my um not in my career, like in my artistic development as a kid, I became obsessed with anatomy. Um, and you can focus on it so much that you get very, very granular and you start thinking about each individual muscle. That's not as important as knowing the large forms that those muscles make together and how they wedge together. And that's something that George Bridgman talks about. And uh, George Bridgman, I, I don't know if I put up my Bridgman post yet, but I will. Uh, Bridgman talks about it's like the thoracic volume, like the chest, which are you know, the pecs and, and, and the rib cage and the abdominals and how those wedge into the pelvis. 
that's more important than knowing, you know, the rectus abdominis, the lateral oblique, uh, the serratus anterior. Like, that's actually more important a concept to know when it comes to anatomy. Also, um, uh, when it comes to anatomy, if you're going to be learning muscles, best thing to do, get that, um, go to my blog, look up that uh, Goldfinger Anatomy book. Get that, because that book will tell you the origin and insertion of every muscle that he talks about. If you know the origin and insertion of a muscle, like for example, if you um, are working on, like this is, you know, this is a fantasy example, so they've taken some liberties here. But for example, like um, the pectoralis, which has three heads, and part of it's missing here because the, the chest cavity is open. But there's a clavicular head, the pectoralis muscle, there is a um, sternal head here, and then there is a um, costal head down here that attaches to the thoracic arch. Sorry, there's a siren going by. I know that these um, originate at the clavicle, the sternum, and the thoracic arch, and insert down here on the humerus. So if you know that, and you just take your damn standard brush, for example, and stroke in the direction from the origin to the insertion, that's the direction the muscle goes. So you're 80% of the way there if you know those two things. And a lot of times just sketching in the general flow of the muscle, knowing its origin insertion will will fill in so much of that detail in between. I think that's easier than maybe learning the whole shape of the deltoid. Like if you try and figure out the whole shape of the deltoid, having never really thought about the deltoid before, it can be quite confusing. However, if you understand like the deltoid originates along the, the spine of the scapula, I haven't worked the back very, very much, but the spine of the scapula is here, right there. And your your, your deltoid originates there. It, ha it also has three heads. Um, it originates, I'm going off on a tangent here that I wasn't expecting to go on. It originates here at the um, acromion process. You can feel that. It's the bony point right there on your shoulder. And the first third of the clavicle right here, that's... The, that part is, is is covered by the deltoid as well. So that's your origin. And if you know that it inserts down here on the humerus and it makes a sort of like curved shape uh, and, it, and it's sort of like a supine position, then um, that gives you a whole lot of information about the deltoid. You can fill in the spaces in between those two bits of information a lot easier. I think it's very important to sort of box in these ideas um, because so many things in art and in anything can be vast, like ZBrush can look vast when you open it, but it's not. If you box in the idea and say, okay, well, I want to understand this particular thing, give yourself a framework to understand it, it goes much, much faster. So that's why I demystify the ZBrush interface when I teach ZBrush. As I say, you know, every single thing you see on your screen right here is just cloned out of these menus up here. Like these menus are there to go in for the particulars, but all this stuff here that lives in those menus. So it's like that's sort of boxing in a big idea to give you a framework to sort of master it. <clears throat> uh, Jesse dot art. No, I left Weta uh, like five years ago. I live in London now. Yeah, deltoids do look like garlic cloves. I can see that for sure. Is it difficult getting away from traditional anatomy? Um, no, I mean, I think it's really, it's, it's helpful to have little touchstones that are either human or ana animal anatomy. Like if, if, if you're making something that's a creature, uh, it's gonna be more successful if there's little things that you can hang hang the realism off of. Like, you know, if it's, if it's shoulders work correctly. For example, you know, is, is, is it walking erect like a person or is it shoulders flung forward quite a bit, like maybe a black bear standing on its hind legs when the way those arms hang forward. So pulling things from, from actual anatomy would make it much more successful. <clears throat> yes, London does have funny sounding sirens and they're the loudest sirens in the world. They're absolutely awful when, when you're on the street and you hear one because it, it will deafen you. All right, so let me just go back to my outline here really, really quickly and make sure that I don't... Um, that's the anatomy book that I'm ref referencing, actually. If you go to my my blog, go to maddiemonster.com and go to the Maddie Monsters Library, that's the, the book that I was recommending earlier. So I'm going to actually close out of that. And I'm going to go back to my outline just to make sure that I stay on topic because it's I've got so much to say, I can sometimes go off on a tangent. So ending image, some of the things we discussed, final Z tool, compare to the endpoint, I showed the custom light menu pop up, but I'll show you how to make that later. 
sculpting process. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, I, I did a little history video of how we got here. So I'm just going to run this. And then, um, unfortunately, I, I wrote it out this morning with the whole interface by accident. But um, <clears throat> I'll talk about some of the things that are happening as they're happening here. So I did a lot of, a lot of work thinking about the hands here. Um, and everything's all swinging around. But um, <clears throat> a big thing when I'm sculpting things like the hands, if you watch here, um, you'll see that I'm using the trim dynamic brush a lot to knock in planes. And I'm using the clay tubes brush to build up areas and then knocking them back with planes. So the idea there is like, I, I wanna make sure as I'm working on those fingers, I always have a really clear sense of the block inside of those fingers and the relationship between each knuckle stays consistent because those can't, really, I did a little proportional change there. Those things can't change. Your fingers aren't gonna rotate down their, their, their Z axis as it were. Uh, so those knuckles, those bony landmarks stay in relation to one another. So it's very, very helpful to think about the hands or the fingers as being little blocks. And I've actually got a little model I can show you of that. <clears throat> There's where I started thinking about the negative spaces, just basically moving around. And here, once again, I'm using um, the trim dynamic brush and the clay tubes brush to knock back planes. Like a lot of times people, um, it, it's occurred to me recently, a lot of times people are doing a lot of smoothing and I, I realized I don't do an enormous amount of smoothing like I did when I first started using ZBrush. I do a lot of refinement on the surface by taking um, the clay tubes brush and using the alt key to knock back a plane or using the trim dynamic brush to knock back a plane uh, and then doing a very, very light smoothing around those. That's just sketching in some, some wrinkles there. And I never consider anything like that to be final. I sketch it in quickly and move on to the next thing because I want to uh, keep moving around the figure and uh, and see what develops. So I'm putting asymmetry into the lips there. It's kind of funny to see it without the, the teeth subtool. And that's, I think, is that the end of that? Yep, that's the end of that. So I'll just go back here. I'm having a hard time grabbing that. Now it's not gonna play back normally, so that's fine. So what I was talking about with the hands, like it's really, really useful. Like this is just a hand in a neutral position and it's not even really relaxed, but the idea behind this is, <clears throat> excuse me. So I've got my skeleton hand here, which is in, you know, a rigid, you know, the fingers splayed out position. But when I'm working on those hands, I'm thinking about keeping the relationship between the um, um, proximal and distal. Proximal is close to you in proximity. Distal is distant, further from you. So that's the proximal head of that phalange. That's the distal head. Uh, the relationship between the knuckles, which is what those are, stays consistent. And if you just visualize them as boxes, it can be really helpful. And those boxes, you know, I could rotate and pose these if I wanted to. But the important thing is to just remember that shape, because as I'm as I'm working up those hands, what um. And I would still go into these actually a bit further, but we'll I, we'll just zoom into one of them and take a look uh, at the point that we are at. <laughs> it's always just a bit of a delay when I um when I stream. So here we go, nice little purple fingernail lacquer. There we go. So if I'm thinking about keeping those bony landmarks consistent. The perspective here is throwing that off a little bit. That was actually giving me quite a bit of trouble because it felt like that was shorter than it was. I might even move that back a bit further, but the important thing here is that we're thinking about that sort of box there. Let me go ahead and make sure I'm on this tool here. So I've got, you know, the distal end of the metacarpal, which is the hand bone, the long bone is the hand, and then uh, the distal and proximal end of these two phalanges. And then I've got this plane. Let's turn off polypaint on this so we can see this properly. I should probably turn, knock that noise back. I put a little noise on there just so I could have some specular tooth. Let me go to... I'm going to load up a different project here. I'm going to get a file open. No, I'm not going to save the project, but I'm going to go to 
before I posed it when I was working on the hands. So I think that is 26. We'll open up this one. So this probably won't have surface noise on it. We can just see the surface a lot clearer. We'll look at some questions while that's loading. Oh god, it's loading the undo history. I didn't want to load the undo history. Ugh. I forgot to turn that off. All right, well, I'll show you how to delete your undo history once it's up. What made you get into monsters versus other streams within ZBrush? I've always made monsters. Um, I um, I I used to make Halloween masks in my parents' basement. I had a little arts area in my in the basement in the house I grew up in, and um, I've always made monsters. I love monsters. Um, I'm going to be doing a live stream for Noman next week where I'm going to talk a lot about monsters and the uncanny and sort of a lot of design, like stuff around some of the design stuff I've done on like Pacific Rim 2 and Kid Who Would Be King and my personal work and what it is that sort of informs my thoughts around creatures and, and characters. But when it comes to monsters, I could just say that like, I just, I love them and I don't think of them as scary. Like it never occurred to me to be scared of monsters. Zombies scare me but monsters typically don't. Um, <clears throat> and I think they're beautiful, and it's that beauty that attracts me to them. And I like there to be a lot of, like, sometimes there's a lot, I try and put some emotion into the creatures that I do, um, because I find that sort of, um, oh, what's the word I'm searching for? Um, alienation, and that sort of tragedy around the, the, the monstrous figure is quite beautiful. I love, so I just love them. And it's a great opportunity to make interesting shapes. Um, you know, I like I like making shapes. I like the human form, but uh, monsters make me happy. It's just one of those things. Cool. All right, so that's loaded up, and now we can see those hands more clearly. So this is about midway through the hand process, but it'll give us a chance to, to do a little demo of what I was doing as I was working on them. Mm. I find the delay due to the stream really, really frustrating. There we go. Okay. And I'll just check my geometry. I very rarely spend much time at the highest subdivision level. I think it's not useful at all for the most part. I think it's actually detrimental. That's another thing. If you're just starting out with ZBrush, don't divide your models up as high as you can and work there. High subdivision levels make life harder on you because you, you're going to spend the vast majority of your time thinking about big shapes, and it's harder to work on those at a high subdivision. So I'm going to step this down and say, okay, here. So this is about halfway through the process. So if we look at the hand here, I'm going to turn the floor plane off so it stops getting in my way. And let's try and get a good view on this. Here we go. All right, so you can see our phalange here. So I'm thinking about this volume and this volume. And I'm thinking about the phalange in between them. And then the soft tissues underneath. And I'm thinking about the planes that that makes. That's still that box. That volume still sits within that finger box that I showed you uh, in the other in the other file. So if I'm working up something like this, typically what I do is, um, oh, good golly, come on back here. Ah. There we go. Uh, I'll take the clay tubes brush. Uh, I will turn off the alpha. I very rarely use the alpha on the clay tubes brush. I'll take my focal shift and turn it down. And this gives me kind of a softer brush, <clears throat> a more subtle brush. And then um, I'll sort of build up a form with this. What you doing? Why are you doing this to me? There we go. Uh, there we go. So I'll build that up like so. And then I'll take B for brush, T for trim, D for dynamic, trim dynamic. And I'll knock back a plane with that. Then I'll knock back the edge, making a little plane there. A lot of times people will just sort of smooth this, but smooth is destructive. It, it takes away what you've worked on. 
even if you turn down your, your smooth intensity, it's still destructive. It's better to have more control and think about the planes the whole time. So you do something like this, and then you can just very gently smooth like that with a smaller brush, and it cleans that stuff up. It's like if you're doing a painting, you don't want to get rid of all your brush strokes. You don't want to smooth everything out because then it just starts to look like a real generalized form. It doesn't look as appealing. And I don't think you have as much control that way. So it's a very, very similar idea here. So I'll take my clay tubes brush again and just make sure that, that the relationship between the knuckles stays consistent. So here I build up this plane here. And if you look at your fingers, you know, you've got great hand models at the end of both your wrists, or hopefully. Um, <clears throat> you know, I'm these relationships, these planes won't change. Another nice thing about the clay tubes brush is it will add into recessed areas first. So I can come over here and sort of fill that out, come over here and fill this out. And then again, I've got a hot key for my trim dynamic brush. It's the number six on my keyboard. I'll just come in here and I will just plane this back. So let's knock that back a little bit. And then this is a nice thing about subdivision levels. If I step down my subdivision levels, I can do things like this. I can take my move brush and I can make a big shape change here. I want to grab this and pull it forward. So if I was doing this while I was dealing with like, you know, seven million polygons, it wouldn't be nearly as easy to do. And I can also do things like this. Like if I want to just, you know, maybe I'll step up one subdivision level here so I can get an extra bit of roots there. Maybe I want to take the knuckle here. I'll hold down the Alt key with the Move brush, and I'll just start pulling this out. And I want to sort of really accentuate this plane change, this break between that surface and that surface. And when I step back up my subdivision levels, that goes up the chain. So there we go. So I get a really clean division here. So this is what I'm looking for. I'm looking for this. Come on. I'm just going to use my bracket keys to change my brush size. There we go. Come on. Ooh, that delay. There we go. This plane. And this plane. And then when I get down here, I might turn on my, my second light. So I'll go to my, my little light menu and I'll turn my second light on. And that's very descriptive, as you see. But it's um, I'm going to go to the color. And again, I'm going to desaturate it. So that was more of like a presentation sort of light, where I wanted that sort of turquoise rim light. But for sculpting, I don't really want there to be a lot of color in that. So I'll knock that back to there. So that's really descriptive there. That, that rim light helps me see what I know is already there. There's a concavity there. Um, so you can see that. Then I'll just take my clay tubes brush. And I'll step down a subdivision level. And it's just second nature for me to step down and up subdivision levels. Like, I, I will sketch things out in, Z, in Dynamesh for sure, but I want to get to subdivision levels sooner than later once I've got my shapes established if I want to sort of refine and work that form. So that's just the, the very end um, phalange, the tip of the finger. So what I will do is I would go in here and I would make sure that this plane is accurately represented. I would take my damn standard, or excuse me, my trim dynamic brush, knock this back a little bit here. And I get a lot of questions from people in my classes, like, how do I do fingernails and claws? Because they always end up looking weird. Well, this is like probably the number one reason why is because the fingertip hasn't been sort of considered uh, with the rest of the, um, the, uh, the phalanges like this. So it's not consistent. So maybe the fingertip is sort of twisted around a little bit. It's just you don't have a really strong mechanical structure in the fingers. And if you take the time to get this and, and really establish the plane back here, what you can end up doing is then you can just mask out the fingertip and then extract um, fingernails from that. And they're going to be sitting in the right place because you very you spent a lot of time establishing the planes of the fingers as you were sculpting. So, you know, as I was working this, I would say, well, that's coming out too far. I want to get rid of, knock that back a little bit. Although this is supposed to be kind of an emaciated, creepy creature. So I might accentuate so the, the, the knuckle bones and the boniness of the hands. I think like hands are beautiful and expressive. So there's a lot of stuff you can do as you're working on them. <clears throat> also, when you're working on things like hands uh, like this, uh, anytime you've got a uh, little 
Ooh, that fingertip. So here's a good good thing. I'm going to mask out. Ooh, that delay. This always gets me every time I stream. Like if I turned the stream off, everything would just be totally going fine, but that would defeat the purpose because then you couldn't see it. But there's just something about the Wacom driver and the stream. It slows it down. So what I'm doing is I'm just building up that fleshiness in the tip of the finger, but I've masked down to this 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 bend there, that bend right there. So I just want to make sure that I have a little bit of overlap there, and then I can see from the underside I would need to fix that, and then that's dipping in a little bit. So here I would step down my subdivisions. Just make sure that I'm looking at it from the right angle. Take my move brush and just make sure that, just like we did from the back view, make sure the, the, the underside view here, there's a consistency and the structure for each, just think of each each phalange, each finger joint as being its own little box and that'll be really helpful. And don't neglect the little creases in there. And then I'll take the clay tubes brush and sort of work up the the fleshiness. But what I came to the underside to say other than that was, um, and here too, I would I could spend the whole stream redoing the hands. So I guess uh, because this is about midway through the hand process, this particular save, so it gets us to the point where I can sort of show you where I moved on from here based on this, and it gives you an idea of how we got to this point. Here you can see I'm already thinking about that plane on the thumb there, the back of the thumb. Just everything I'm trying to make sure has got um, a sense of planes to it. So I can take my trim dynamic brush and just think about these plane changes. And then, then I would smooth that. And I would often turn my Z intensity down on my smooth brush. So what I was saying was when you're working on fingers, sometimes depending on the size of your model, this came up earlier, somebody was talking about model size and brushes. Um, your brush can bleed through to the other side. So what I would do is just always be aware that you can go to brush, auto masking, and turn on back face mask. <clears throat> Excuse me, I need to drink some coffee. Back face mask will keep your brush from bleeding through to the other side of the mesh. And it, it's all kind of dependent on brush size and scale of the object. Um, so. so I really like this posture in the fingers here. I like that a lot. I got that from Gasly Graham Ingalls, who you should all look up. Gasly Graham Ingalls and Bernie Reichston. That sort of posturing in the hand of the creepy hand shapes. Ghastly Graham Ingalls, I don't know if you, you can't see the bookcase behind me, but he was a, an illustrator in the 1950s that worked for uh, EC Comics and he did Tales from the Crypt, Vault of Horror, and Haunt of Fear, and he created The Old Witch. And he did, he was an amazing illustrator, and, and I remember the way he drew hands when I saw them when I was little really stuck with me, and I just like that posturing, so that's what I was, I'm starting to try and get in that. Um, <clears throat> Again, thinking about the plane here at the back of the wrist, you see I've already started blocking that in. And then here, this would be the um, uh, extensors of the forearm, but I have a little dent there. <coughs> so because I'm, I'm thinking of these as planes, this is a good chance for me then to go in and maybe take the clay tubes brush at a really low subdivision level just to fix that little concavity. Or I could take the move brush and hold down the alt key and just pull it forward. Do a little bit of smoothing on it and then step back up and that should fix that. So like if you just try and think a lot, <clears throat> you don't have to make everything look like a robot. But if you just try and think a lot about where you're putting the planes uh, on the organic forms and then soften the edges between those planes, you have a much more structurally appealing looking thing. Uh, and a lot of times just people don't think about planes until you know much, much later in their sort of sculpting career when someone points it out to them or they come to it on their own. Let's turn solo off. How are we on time? Oh my goodness, I've already been talking for an hour. So I wanted to mention something about scale and there was a uh, ghastly Graham Ingalls. Yep, Doug, thanks for reposting that so people can see. Um, so someone, I'm just gonna go over to my outline again. I should use both my screens, actually. I'm going to take this outline. I'm going to move it over here. 
and put it on this screen so I don't have to keep going between the chat and the outline. There we go. That makes much more sense. I've got three screens here now, so I'm like all set. Um, so ZBar scales. This is something that um, can throw a wrench in the works for you, um, depending on the tools you're using. And I remember way back when I first started using ZBrush, uh, I used to have to open up my OBJ files that I exported from ZBrush in a text editor because you know OBJ files are just text files. They're just like you can open up an OBJ file in a text editor and read the coordinates. And in there, there would be an export factor, I think, which was the export factor ZBrush was using when it exported your model. Because when you bring a model into ZBrush, ideally it's in, in uh, brush units. And you can find your brush units. You can find your object scale by going to um, geometry size. And that will tell you what size your model is. So this uh, XYZ size is 1.8. Two is ideal. Two brush units is ideal. So let's open something that's not two brush units. Um, and I'll show you how you can um, work with this. So I think if I go to a load tool, and go to my demonstration files. I should have, like if I go back to the last demo start, that one's not going to be two brush units. <clears throat> Everyone always asks me this, uh, Hannibal, um, which it's a good question. Why use the clay tubes brush over clay buildup? Because the clay buildup brush is very aggressive. The clay buildup brush is just boom, 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 boom. It does that. It builds up. Now, if I was trying to make a rock in a background, for example, or if I was gonna, if I was dynameshing and I wanted to build out a horn, I would use something like clay buildup. For, but for sculpting form and 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 anatomical form and sculpting um, folds and wrinkles and things like that, I don't want to be so aggressive. I like to do what I call sneaking up on shapes. I, I gently work my way into the form with uh, softer brushes, and that's why I use clay tubes instead of clay buildup. Hi, Saeed. Sorry, just checking other messages. Um, what I'll do is I'll finish off um, the, the Photoshop uh, paint over. And I'll post it up on um, ZBrush Central, and I put the links to all the all the videos, including this one, on there. So if you want to watch the whole process, you can watch the whole process. Uh, if you haven't seen the other parts, <clears throat> uh, Josh, are you raising your hand with a question? It's best just to type it in. Well, I save undo history for this because I was going to potentially make videos, um, like I showed earlier. But no, I usually don't save my undo history unless I have a real specific idea, like I want to use the history project brush or something like that. Oh, hi. Hello, Josh. Uh, OK, so this one, if you look, you see this is 36 brush units in XYZ. So that's huge. So what do we do? This is a pretty misunderstood plugin. I found it impenetrable when I was first looking at it. I had to really um, revisit it to get it. Uh, Scale Master. So here we have Scale Master. Now what Scale Master does is it allows you to store an object or set an object scale and then resize it to work ideally within ZBrush. So if you've ever had something be too big for your brush or too small for your brush, or if you've ever had something just not behave normally, oftentimes it could be because your scale is messed up. Under geometry size, they're under brush units. That's brush units. Edgar, answering Edgar's question. So here, let's see how big this is in feet. I'm going to set it to feet, and I'm going to click um, sliders to subtool size, making sure that I'm on the largest subtool, uh, the body. So in Y, uh, that's three feet. So if you imagine the pubic bone is the midpoint of the figure, um, that would be a little under six feet tall, but you know, it's good enough. It's close enough, I suppose. So um, let's say now I, I'm like, okay, well, this is great, but this is entirely too big to be working in ZBrush. My brush size is too small. You know, things are not, you know, I, I, I run into this issue where then I have to double click to turn off dynamic to get my brush size the right size. So things like that, you know, you might you might run into problems. You may also run into problems uh, with some of the rendering in ZBrush if your scale is off. 
I'm trying to think of other things where it's given me issues. Um, I, for most of my stuff, I'm, I'm poly painting um, the first pass and then I do the rest in Photoshop. If it's something that needs to, sorry, there's another siren going by. I live on the main street, so there we go. Um, if I'm doing something that needs to go down a pipeline, um, uh, I would typically paint it in Mari because Substance Painter couldn't handle UDIMs until yesterday, unless you're on the beta. I think they had a beta that was doing UDIMs before that, but I like Substance Painter. Um, I'm pretty software agnostic other than ZBrush. I'm pretty loyal to ZBrush because it's just, it's been, there. you know, o Ofer has a, a, a way of thinking about things that he creates tools that you don't know you need until he's made them. So um, ZBrush I'm pretty, pretty consistent with, but when it comes to texture painting, I mean, I would do Substance or... Um, or Mari from painting a texture, but generally I'm, I'm painting something in, in poly paint and then painting on top of it in Photoshop. Thank you, Dustin R. Uh, who is the fastest sculptor? I don't know. I don't know. Um, I'm just reading your questions here. Okay. Uh, what was I doing? Oh, yeah. Scale Master. Usually I'm pretty good about not getting derailed because I've been teaching. I teach classes at Nomen Online, like I said, like twice a week. And I've been teaching for 16 year, 14 years now. So it's been really great for multitasking. And I'm usually pretty good at multitasking anyway. So it's I can usually answer questions and not get um, derailed. So I need to set uh, this object scale. So I, I know that it's set to, to three, three feet more or less and that's reasonable I mean honestly I would probably change this um, another issue is that if I want to send this out into um, you know another another renderer like Keyshot it can be nice to have it the actual size of the object because that will impact the behavior of some of the lights and some of the materials in there but within ZBrush I want it to be two brush units so what I do is I click ZBrush scale utility and what this does is it takes each subtool and then it will size them down to that ideal uh, ZBrush scale, which is two brush units. It's just an internal scaling inside of ZBrush. So this is a temporary scaling. It only lives in ZBrush, only lives in the Z tool. Look how much smaller that is. It's kind of fun to watch that go through. And there we go. So now this is set to two brush units. So if we go to geometry size, you see we're at 1.6, which is close enough. It may not be exactly at two, but that's quite close. Um, <clears throat> so um, now I can do my thing and work on this. And the benefit of Scale Master is if I go to tool export, it's not gonna export the right scale, but if I click feet, export to unit scale and then turn on all if I want to do them all or just leave that off if I just want to do one I can export my model back out at the correct scale so this is a good way to keep from um, running into issues if you are supplying um, models for pipeline you don't want to mess up their scale by sending them back something that's tiny compared to what they were working on if you bring in a model that you need to sculpt on top of for example like um, the dem the demonstration that I or the talk that I always use in, in my classes is like you know on Battle of Five Armies, they wanted another cave troll, so they already had one or a battle troll. They already had three, so they gave me the model they were using and said make us a new troll. So I just took that and and divided it up in ZBrush and then and made a new troll, and then exported it out it needed to stay the same scale and needed to keep the same topology because obviously it was already in a pipeline. So it wouldn't do any good for, for me to make a new cave troll or new battle troll and um, have it be the wrong scale. That would just be a real headache for everybody involved. So um, 
so this allows you to make sure that your scaling comes out consistently. I need to turn off that save undo history. That's that's a real pain in the butt. Okay. All right. Okay, you can stop now. You can stop now. You can stop now. So another thing about this um, scale master that I want to point out is if you go on to the uh, Pixelogic website, there is the Keyshot Scale Sender plugin right here. And this Keyshot Scale Sender will basically take your model and then send it to Keyshot at its actual scale, not the ZBrush scale. And that could be very useful as well. But we'll revisit that because there's other things I want to talk about about getting things over into ZBrush. Uh, same thing. Uh, I I I two twenty thirteen. I don't. Is there, I guess twenty thirteen. The username twenty thirteen. Yeah, it's the same thing. I mean, you just export using that scale scale master, and it will come. It'll come in and out the right scale, which is really helpful because for a long time that was a real problem. Cool. All right. So. If you watch the earlier streams, I want to show you something that I was thinking about the other day. Um, I made these COVID proteins using a mesh, a vector displacement brush. That was the first stream. I showed how to make a vector displacement brush to make these little proteins coming off the head. The other day, though, I was thinking, hey, I've got another way that I could show to do that that might be really cool for people. So if I go to load tool, and I'm going to load in this demo tool here, COVID fibers. I'm going to turn off my thumbnail. And this is just a sphere. This is just a polysphere. That's all. Nothing special. But I have masked it. There's a mask on the whole sphere. So what I will do is I will go to Fiber Mesh. Best way to learn Fiber Mesh is to open up the Fiber Mesh demo files and just load one in there. So that we have a big hairy ball. Go to modifiers and you can change things like the, the length of the hair. You can change the gravity if you want the hair to stand straight up. You can turn the gravity down. You can do things like this. And of course, if you render it, it will show you what it actually looks like because this is just preview geometry. You can see your fiber mesh rendered. Fiber mesh is actually really useful for all sorts of things other than hair. There you go. So there's our um, preview fibers. If these don't exist yet, if I want to accept this, I have to click the accept button there, and that will accept that and make it into actual geometry or into an actual fiber mesh. What I've done is I've created a preset. I'm going to click open. And I'm going to open this preset. It's called COVID fibers, and this will be pretty neat. Look at that. That's also fiber mesh. I've created these little proteins using fiber mesh. And the way that I did that is I turned my max fibers down, for one thing. It's at um, 0 0.190. If I turn that up, you see it vastly increases the number. Even that's kind of cool on its own. Uh, but I'll put 0 0.019 again. Or no, 0 0.19. 0 0.19. There we are. Um, so I reduced my max fibers. The length, um, I just adjusted until they were long enough that it looked like the microscopy image of the fiber, of the uh, COVID virus. Um, width profile. Oh, also, there's length variation here. So you can add variation to the length so they're not all the same height. That's really, really helpful, too. <clears throat> Um, then there is the width profile. So this is how I changed it from being just a, a strand of hair to this sort of um, stalk with a bulb at the top. If I take this point and pull it down, look what happens. The end gets smaller. If I bring it up, the end gets thicker. That's obviously between the, the widest point and the stalk. If I bring that down, it gets really, really tiny. If I bring that up, it starts to taper up. Then this gets much, much bigger. And then I can taper it back down at the tip, just like that. Now, if I were to change the focal shift on this, I can adjust where that bulging happens. 
See that? We can make them into little spikes. So you can make all sorts of stuff using um, fiber mesh that's more than just fibers. Now for the color, I just set a base and a tip color and then I colorize the base and colorize the tip. That's really all there is to that. And of course there is a color profile curve as well that's worth experimenting with. Um, so if I'm happy with this, what I would do, I set my profile to six. If the profile is too low, you're gonna get something like that. You're not actually gonna see the, the object you want to see. So I turn that up to six or even higher and that gives me um, proper geometry. And then my segments, I've turned up to 21. If I turn these down, you see that I don't get the nice curvature to it. If I turn it up, I start to get that nice sort of variation in curvature. Hi, Scott Pappy. <laughs> Happy extruder, that's funny. Um, okay, uh, da, 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 da. right, so then, Again, this is a preview, it doesn't exist. I click accept, now this actually exists. This is geometry that's that's a thing. Um, if I wanted to move these around, you know, you can um, you could just take your move brush and move things around, but you'll notice that the they stay rooted on the spot, which is usually desirable. You want your, your fiber mesh objects to stay rooted on the spot. If at any point you wanted to change the, the full positioning, all you have to do is go to brush and go to the auto masking and turn off auto mask fiber mesh. And now the move brush moves the entire fiber mesh. So that's something that um, gets overlooked a lot, but it's, it's pretty handy if you ever do need to shift an entire fiber mesh object. So I just kind of wanted to show that. Um, is there a way to make fiber mesh into a printable mesh? Well, this could be a printable mesh right now. I mean, like I've I, I've exported fiber mesh objects as OBJs for people to use in previs, but um, you know what we could do here is go to the COVID sphere, go to mer. Actually, before I do that, I'm going to select the fiber mesh here and divide it. I'm going to go to the sphere. I'm going to go to merge, merge down, click OK. So I've now merged these into a single object. Now I go to the gizmo. So that's the, just the move tool. And then there is the um, gear inside there. Sorry, I have to drink some water, some coffee. <clears throat> and um, <clears throat> in here we have um, <coughs> Uh, remesh by union. Hopefully this works. Believe that's going to work. Remesh by union. Cool. Then, if I'm not mistaken now, I mean, you could always just dynamesh them together. Yeah, good, that did work. You see, those have now been joined to that sphere. They are absolutely printable. Now you might run into a situation where they're, depending on the scale you're printing them, that they're too small. So, you know, I might mask that out and then do maybe a little um, global inflate by going to <clears throat> deformation and using my inflate slider to inflate those. And then show all again, turn off frame mode. So there you go. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's printable geometry to answer your question. You know somebody who wants to print fiber mesh hair? Well, I mean, you can make geometry from your di your fiber mesh and then dynamesh it. And it's a good way to start like like the forms of hair that is going to that's going to be printed. But it's all about if you're going to take that path, then the most important thing to remember is you have to go to your fiber mesh settings come down here and make sure that your preview setting or your, um, your your profile and segments are high enough that it's actually generating geometry that's usable because otherwise you're just going to basically get cards. Oh, thank you. I'm, cl I'm glad you find it creepy. I love it when things are creepy. Well, if you generate them the way I just generated them, Hannibal, where they've got like a large volume to them, 
they'll be overlapping and then you can just remesh by volume by union like I just did or you can dynamesh them together you can make them into um, a volume <clears throat> uh, hit Pratty, how did you start with your concept art or has it become a habit muscle memory of directly sculpting out and thinking while working on it um, just Well, I mean that's that's a big question. Like like what like for for sculpting um creature stuff. Let me go back to my my guy here. Um I will uh, it sort of depends. Like if I if I've got a brief, I'll start I mean I always thumbnail. I can try really hard to do lots of thumbnailing because the first first idea is very rarely the best one, but sometimes it is. Um and you, I want to work out the things that are like really common ideas, and I want to get a, try and get away from those. Um, when I'm sculpting forms, I'm, I'm thinking about form, and I'm thinking about, you know, if I've got a theme, like a lot of my personal work, I've always said it's it's very heavily influenced by um, like religious iconography, especially Roman Catholic and Byzantine art, um, uh, the sublime. I'm going to talk a lot about this at my Nomen event next week. So if you keep an eye on the Nomen page, I'm going to do a whole thing that's just on the bogey lady creature that I did and talking about um, what I think about and what I look to for inspiration and some things you might not think about where I, where you can find inspiration. Um, like I get some inspirations pretty unusual places. Um, but when it comes to like the sculpting, yeah, I'm, I'm, it's muscle memory and I'm, I am thinking about things. Sometimes I might find that I, I have tuned out and I'm on autopilot and, and that doesn't always do, do good. Sometimes I need to get back on manual pilot as it were. Um, uh, I definitely need to remember to disable this undo history save. I'm going to reset my ZBrush here in just a second because it looks like I've got quite a delay on the stream now. Sorry for slurping in everybody's ear just then. All right, let's reset this. We'll go to Preferences, Initialize ZBrush. Yes, I want to initialize ZBrush. And I'm going to check my outline here and see what the next thing I wanted to talk about was. All right, so the varied approach to the COVID protein, we did that. We looked at the end spot. We looked at the thumbnail view, the distribution of negative spaces, leading lines, arcs, and diagonals. Talked about the hand structure in the history movie, relationships in the blocks and the phalanges. Um, oh, that's another thing too. Often, also, I turn perspective on and off a lot when I'm working um, because let me load up the Z tool this time so we don't get the undo history with it. <clears throat> um, a lot of you get a lot. I think you get a lot of description by looking in between your. Um, your perspective view and your orthographic view. And this was especially true for me when I first started doing 3D printing. Cause I, I mean, my first job digital pipeline was art director at um, General Giant Studios in Burbank. Great little company. They were building up their um, their their art and, and um, uh, models and textures department and um, getting everybody moved over onto digital sculpting from clay, which is, I have really conflict, conflicted feelings about the fact that like I went in, I got that started. And I realized the other day too, when I was in my storage space, and I will put up a blog post about this, we actually did the first commercial figure that was done in ZBrush because this was before um, Decimation Master. You couldn't decimate something very easily. Uh, there were a cut, I think Stanford University had a decimation program that was freeware, but it wouldn't handle a million polygons. But we used, um, Oh, it's a manufacturing program that costs as much as a car, and I'm blanking on the name now. Oh, uh, oh my gosh. I'm blanking on the name. It'll come back to me after the stream is over. It's an ex It was an extremely expensive program, and they used it to process LiDAR data and scan data. And, and um, Magix. You know, yeah, I remember Magix, but it wasn't that. I don't think it was that. It was, um, I keep wanting to say Shapeways, but that's the, the website that does 3D printing. Oof. Yeah, it's a manufacturing and uh, CAD program. Just looking at the questions right now. 
Um, so we were able to actually decimate a Z tool that had been exported at like, you know, 2 million polygons. So it was actually a Grindylo. I'll show I'm, I'm going to grab it. Hang on. I'll show you a little, little bonus on the street. One second. This had been sitting in my, um, 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 storage space. So let me make sure I could actually see what's on the camera because I've got my camera hidden right now. So you, yeah, it was a Harry Potter figure. It's the little Grindylo, like him, right, right, right there. That little guy. Um, it was 2006. It was a Comic Con exclusive, and I and and I'm reasonably sure that's the first time anybody made um, a a commercial figure using uh, ZBrush. So it was printed, uh, cast in wax, and then there's amazing sculptor at General Giant, um, Whitney. And uh, I, I'm blanking on her last name, but I'm going to put her name in the blog post, and then I'll put it up on my uh, on my on my on my page. Um, she did the finishing because uh, uh, the tentacles we didn't have insert brushes yet, so the tentacles needed a lot of love. But it was really neat that that you know we were able to do that um, with 3D printing. What was I talking about? What was the point of that? <sighs> Something about. Oh yeah, yeah. So when I was 3D printing a lot, I was realizing that I, you know, things didn't quite look right once I got it off the printer. And then I just started developing an eye by always looking at something with perspective on, with perspective off, going into the Maya camera. Don't do that anymore. Now I, I will use the ZBrush perspective camera more often since it's been improved, but I'll still take things into KeyShot and look at them in KeyShot uh, under the perspective camera there because it's just, there's something a little different there in the lighting and, and, and other bits and pieces. Um. <clears throat> so the 19, I want to show you something cool, how I did the, um, the 19 on the forehead up here. All right. Um, I wanted that Roman numeral on there just because it just thematically it was, it was, it was quite cool. And it, you know, obviously it's COVID-19. So I'm going to load up the tool that I use to do that. Oh, it's over here. Um, Boolean, 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 Boolean. Where'd it go? Block head, block in hand, hand start. Where did it go? Cavity paintbrush. Huh. Neutral before pose. Demo start final. Maybe I saved it up here. Date modified, date modified. Hmm. Sorry, I was just looking for the file that I saved earlier. It's hands posing, neutral before pose. All right, well, I'll just start. I'll just do the whole thing over again. It doesn't matter. Um, we'll do last demo start. So here, if I solo this, you see I've got this 19. So how did we make this? Very, very easily, it's a plugin. And I used this in the first session where I did the, um, uh, uh, the, the, the S, the scalar vector, vector, scale, scalar vector, vector graphic shape to make the little hooks that are on, in the figure. So if you go back and watch the first stream, you'll see this being used for something else. It's 3D, text 3D and vector shapes. So I'll click new text and I'll just type X, I, X for 19 and hit enter and then F for focus and there's my 19. Let's rotate off and go into frame mode. So I could change my font here but I'm pretty happy with that particular font. Uh, if I click this though there's you know I can select any variety of others uh, just by scrolling through. Um, I don't think I'm going to change the font because then I'll just have to go searching for the uh, the one that I liked. So we'll come over here and say we're going to leave it at bold. I can uh, change the extrusion here. So I'll thicken them like this. And I can give it a bevel. 
like that. Or not. I might not give it a bevel. And then there's spacing. And this always kind of bugs me. <laughs> it's This should say kerning. The spacing between typeface is kerning. So you can change the kerning with the spacing slider like that. Um, and this is printable geo. I mean, this is, this is actual geometry. I knew somebody was going to say Comic Sans. Um, so now I will just go back up to... Well, first off, I just want to take this subtool. Here's a neat trick. If you want to very, very quickly take something to the top of the subtool list, shift click the up arrow and it sends it to the top of the list. Neat little trick. Take the body, for example, shift click. It's at the top of the list. So let's take this guy. We'll turn off that and let's make our life easier by um, shift clicking on the eyeball to hide everything else. And then we'll show the body zoom out and take the move gizmo we'll move that 19 forward snap to a side view <laughs> potato potato <laughs> i don't think anybody i don't think it, i don't think that it's possible to have any interest in typeface at all without having a certain sort of pedantic nature i i like typefaces I'm not hugely into fonts like some people I, I've known, but I quite like them. I find them fascinating. Um, like, you know, just read up on the history of things like the, the font that was used in the phone book in America was specifically designed to capture the, the ink um, smear on cheap paper. Like, it's really interesting. Typefaces are cool. But it does lead to another siren. It does lead to a certain sort of pedantic kind of attention to detail. So, well said, Doug. So I'm going to rotate this, and as I rotate, I'm going to hold the shift key, and that's going to snap the angle. I want to get the angle more or less close to um, the angle of the forehead, and I might thicken it a little bit. Maybe, maybe a little bit, a little bit, like, yeah, 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 there we go. And then I'm going to move it down so it's sort of kind of close to the head. And we'll scale it down. Now I'm going to rotate so I'm looking down the z-axis. I'm going to alt-click on the head and I'm going to step up the subdivision levels so it's smooth. Then I'm going to select the, the 19 again and I need to actually divide this. So a couple ways I can do it. I could divide it like that which isn't actually going to work out too terribly well because it's going to smooth everything out. So what I will do is potentially go to geometry crease and I can crease my polygroups like that and then if I divide it should keep eh, it's still rounding things off a little bit um, I could dynamesh it uh, and that should keep the hard edges or I could tessimate it so it's sort of six of one half a dozen the other let's just dynamesh it we'll turn the dynamesh resolution up dynamesh there we go that's good turn off frame mode now we go to B for brush, M for match maker, and I will select the matchmaker brush. Matchmaker. I am going to turn off my X symmetry. I'm going to click and drag, and something strange happened. What happened? If I rotate over, you'll see that shape has now been matched to the shape underneath it. So I can go back to my move gizmo and I can just countersink that. Now I had it off a little bit, but if I just do a slight little rotation there, I can fix it. Um, that will sit perfectly against the surface of the head. I did this, I did some stuff on shields when I was doing shields at, at, at Weta on the Hobbit to make little bits of tracery and decorative bits that would go over armor and shields and stuff like that. So it's really, really nice to be able to do this. Um, uh, now how do we Boolean with it? So this is pretty cool. We have to create a folder for this to work properly. So I will take the, um, the body and I will um, control F to create a new folder and we'll just call it body. And then I'll drag the 19 inside of it and I'll set the 19 to subtract. All right, this is a Boolean subtract. Make sure that that visibility is turned on and then I'll turn on live Boolean and you'll see that we have a subtraction now. 
Uh, there's plenty of good uses for both Tessimate and Dynamesh, uh, Brasson. Um, Tessimate works really nicely for something that's being 3D printed because it's triangulating, and it works really well in conjunction with um, Sculptress Pro Mode. And Dynamesh is great when you want to dynamically adjust the mesh. You don't want to be stuck in one volume. You can just keep pulling things out. So it's sort of, they both have their, their different strengths. Uh, it's kind of up to you to play with both of them and see where they, they work best. Sculptor's promo to me is really the best when you're going to be printing something. Like I will often have something decimated and ready for print. And then I'm looking at it and going, oh God, I want to fix that one particular thing. And before I'd have to divide it, re-sculpt it, and um, and then re-dynamesh or re-decimate it. But with Sculptor's Pro Mode and Tessimate, I can selectively go in and I can Tessimate or Sculptor's Pro decimate something while I'm sculpting it, and it it isn't nearly as as problematic. I don't have to to decimate it again. <clears throat> So I've got the Boolean turned on, but it hasn't been sort of created yet. So how do we um, create this? The first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to duplicate. Actually, I'm not going to duplicate anything. I don't need to. I'm going to click the gear here on the folder, and I'm going to click Boolean folder. <laughs> <clears throat> I'm starting to get an itchy throat. Wouldn't it be ironic? <sighs> <clears throat> I think it's just because I've been talking for however many hours. Oh my goodness, it's 4.30. <laughs> right when my alarm goes off. I had an alarm set for 4.30. So we start at 3, 4.30. Okay, we've got about half an hour left. Um, there we go. So what this does is when I Boolean the folder, it creates a U-mesh. And it quite handily hides the folder. So if we click on this now, there's my Boolean mesh. Woot, woot. Great, but there's no subdivision levels anymore. And I am a big fan of, um, yeah, it's not worth tempting fate, Doug, you're right. Especially because I'm, I'm in, like live in London, like I'm in London, London. But I don't ever leave the house really. I really like staying at home. Oh my goodness, I've gotten so much done. I love it. Because my house is where my books are. I got my books here, I got my plants here. And like, you know, I I used to go out front and smoke sometimes, but now I just, I got this ridiculous vape pipe, which is like, it's it's almost worse than vaping, is vaping from something that's made to look like an old fashioned pipe. It's just somehow even more pretentious. But um, I don't even have to, I don't even have to leave the house. I, I'm trying to go for like no sunshine for a year kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But I enjoy, I enjoy the quiet and, um and I do a lot of Dungeons and Dragons with my friends. So we play through Zoom. So it's not like I don't get sort of like social interaction, but it's been it's been good. But um, you're right. Shouldn't tempt fate. It's quite scary because, you know, I uh, I don't follow everybody on social media and their conspiracy theories and their, their thoughts and stuff like that. I actually find it quite irritating. I haven't been on social media until just recently because of that. But, you know, I still wouldn't want to tempt fate and go out and like, you know, get sick or something. But anyway, here we go. Back to this. We've lost our subdivision levels. And that's, I'm a big proponent of having your subdivision levels. I cannot stress enough how important it is that you're able to step up and down your subdivision levels when you're trying to refine your sculpture. You can't get good form if you can't be subtle and sneak up on it. I, I believe that wholeheartedly. Even back in the day when we were using the haptic 3D arm to sculpt on top of voxel meshes, you would still change your voxel resolution depending on the types of forms you were trying to make. So um, it's just it's just a fundamental of sculpture. When I'm taking clay and sticking clay onto an actual armature, I don't go in and make fine detail immediately. I'm a me I'm starting out making big shapes, and that's the analogy. That's analogous to to working with a lower subdivision level. Detective Spencer. <laughs> Josh Webb, you're asking if there's a special deal for Keyshot with ZBrush. Um, there may be. There's a there's a less expensive Keyshot. I um, because I'm an educator, um, I'm I'm using the educational Keyshot. If you are taking if you're taking my class, and I'm gonna always tell my students, just take a screenshot of your schedule, and you can get the educational version. They say you have to have a student ID, but I mean, if you're in a class, give it a go. Like, screenshot your schedule and send it over. Try and get the educational version. I mean, you can't use it for commercial stuff, but it's great to, to, to have it. 
during lockdown, Lexian like was giving everybody who was using it because I used Keyshot in in our department at work to um to do my renders to paint over just like I do at home. Um, but I didn't have like a commercial license, so they gave me a, a, they gave everybody a free commercial license for like months and months during the lockdown who were working from home. So um, that may still be on. But anyway, back to this. How do we get our subdivision levels back? Well, if we go back to our folder, that's our original model with the subdivision levels. All right. So what I'll do is I will take the 19 and let's just drag it out of the folder and turn it off. Let's take the Boolean version of the head and I only need the, um, the forehead part, really. So I'm going to hide everything but that. Go to Geometry, Modify Topology, <clears throat> Delete Hidden, and focus back in on that. So, you know, I, I don't even really need those little spikes. I'm just going to do a projection here. So let's get this recentered. <coughs> Excuse me. Isolate that again. Delete Hidden. There we go. Now I'll go back to my subtools and bring that up into the folder. It doesn't have to be in the folder, but it just keeps it organized. So I'll go to the head, turn on visibility on that other piece, and then I will typically turn on um, solo in a moment. But when I'm going to mask this head, I'm going to mask out this area where the 19 is, like this. Invert the mask, so only that area is unmasked. Sorry, let me go back to this. That's strange. Why did that not catch? Um, standard brush, control, drawing my mask, right? What are you doing? Drawing my mask. There we go. So I'm just masking out that area where the 19 is going to be. Invert the mask. Great, now I'll turn on solo so I don't have to see that 19 that's sitting under there. Now this is important. I'm going to go to Morph Target and store Morph Target. So I've just stored a copy of the model without any projection. Then I will go to Subtool, Project, and just Project All. And there we go. So it's only going to be as, as good as the, the resolution that um, I'm projecting it from. But also, I wanted this to be kind of jaggy and sort of weird looking anyway. So um, I'm going to clear. Well, what I'll do is I'm going to go back to Morph Target, switch. So I've now switched the Morph Target back to the version that does not have the um, projection. And I'll go to B for Brush, M for Morph, O for Morph Brush. Turn my Z intensity down, and then I'm just going to start brushing that in. Maybe I want it to be deeper here. Maybe there, I want that to be a little bit deeper. Let's turn off frame mode. What an awful way to sculpt. There we go. And I'm going to add a subdivision level, because I actually ended up doing this on a model that didn't have a lot of subdivision levels. So that looks better now. And then I'll take my damn standard brush. And I'm just going to go ahead and, oh, the delay on this is nuts. See, this, it's hard for me to sculpt on the stream the way I normally sculpt. Let me see my camera if you can see. Um, so I've got a Cintiq that's like the 16. It's like this big, okay? So when I'm streaming, there's a bit of delay. So I have to be real kind of just sort of almost delicate with the stroke. When I'm actually working, I'm doing this. I, I work from here and from here when I'm like working out an idea or like sculpting. I'll try and use my forearm and then detail I use my wrist. It's kind of a thing that they would tell you in art school, like with drawing, draw from the arm, draw from the arm. And some of it stuck with me. Um, well, it definitely stuck with me, but it didn't make its way into my Z brushing until I started working on a larger tablet um, and, and 
probably maybe a year or two years into my Z brushing, I realized, oh yeah, I can still work from the arm. Cause I mean, I'll work with my arms and I'm sculpting in clay, depending on the size of the thing that I'm working on. And like the arcs you get with this are different than the arcs you get with this and different than the arcs you get with this. So having that, that real estate to work with is really nice. So like with this, I would be making like strokes like this and I would be like, kind of like, like sculpting to me is a lot like I think when people play music like I I, 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 I kind of feel some of the ideas that I'm trying to put down like if I'm trying to put down jagged little like mean shapes I'll do quick little jagged strokes and if I'm trying to put down something that's bigger and sweeping I'll kind of just get, take myself back from it a little bit and think about a big sweep, sweeping arc and I sort of feel a lot of the shapes I have sometimes joke that it might be a form of synesthesia um Thank you for that, Brass. And yeah, the something is. Yeah. Doug, yes, Wacom drivers are made out of bubblegum and duct tape. They're, they're terrible. Uh, okay, Tobias says there is a ZBrush exclusive key shot. Okay, cool. I thought there was. So good to know. Um, so anyway, just I kind of wanted to bring that up to think about loosening yourself up when you're sculpting. Like things don't have to always be like, and like, it might sound like hippy dippy and stupid, but think about the way your body feels when you're drawing or sculpting or painting, because it is like, I think that like what you feel does kind of have an impact on how you put lines down. And if you just sort of don't stress about it, <laughs> which is hard to do, but try and just like make some bold strokes. And it's, it's real hard for me to show these bold strokes because of the delay, but like, I'll do that. And like, I remember it being hard for me to make strokes like that, but when I didn't really quite know what I was doing yet. And in hindsight, it would have helped me for somebody to say at that point, Maddie, fake it till you make it. Just do it. Just do that. Because that's what my life drawing instructors did for me in school. They said, just make big, just make big strokes. Just make big strokes. And I was like, but they don't look right. And they're like, it doesn't matter. Make big strokes. They'll start looking right. Just don't put yourself, you're going to make it harder for yourself if you're all tensed up and making little scratchy lines. And I think um, it's, uh, unless you want to make little scratchy lines, which is what I'm doing. So now I'm holding down the Alt key um, with the damn standard brush, which pinches up in a really kind of cool way. And I'm just trying to um, sort of pinch the edges of these so maybe it feels a little bit like a scarification or something or a branding. So hopefully that makes sense. Like the, the more time goes by and I spend a lot of time thinking about like how to describe what I do because I'm, you know, I not only do I, do I work professionally, I'm, I'm, I am a, an instructor and you know, that's all about communication and I love teaching because I don't think I think there's two ways of knowing something. You can know something in that you do it, and then you can know something on a whole different level where you know how to communicate it to someone else. You don't have to know how to communicate it. I mean, that's not a prerequisite for being good at something, but I really like being able to communicate something. So I spend a lot of time thinking about like why I do some things I do, which leads me to try new things, which is really valuable. And one thing that I've really come to is like every single thing that I've ever learned from airbrush painting to sculpting, from life drawing to painting, all of it is interrelated and applicable to, to each other. Other than technical limitations or technical concerns about specific medium, like you don't need to know about linseed oil if you're painting in acrylic, and you don't need to know about either one of those if you're painting in poly paint. But questions about color uh, temperature and uh, questions about you know color regions on the face or questions about um, simultaneous contrast all these sorts of things just apply and also sort of like the way of approaching like you know um, an a la prima painting like a painting where you're just sitting out on your front porch painting some like painting the sunset or something like that you know it's like that sort of loose immediacy can inform other medium as well so it's a little, a little abstract maybe i don't know so that's there we go so that was just the boolean used to create that that 19 and that's a little bit more wicked and jaggy and sort of scarification looking than the one i ended up doing on my guy i might go back and redo 
the one that I, I ended up doing and making it a little bit more like that. So I'm going to go back to the final tool here. Make sure that I don't eat into somebody else's time. Okay, good. Uh, eight, nine, ten, hi! Liquid better than linseed oil. Yeah, 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 I used to use liquid. i tell you what's fun. Um, painting um, Sculpey with um, oil paint and, um, and linseed oil because uh, it, it, it's, it gets into the, into the Sculpey and, and it's translucent. Awesome. Okay, um, going back to my outline. I've already tangented so many times, so thanks for sticking with me. But I just think of other things I want to talk about, and then I talk about them. Like I said again, I'm doing that Nomen presentation next week, which I'll be talking just specifically about sort of ideation and some more about sculpting and planes. But also just like, um, I don't want to spoil it, but where the way I think about themes and ideas and creatures and it could be my personal work or it could be something like like breach kaiju and pacific rim too for example like something like that um the nail beds I don't really want to do the nail beds now oh yeah 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 I know what we'll do I don't know what we'll do we'll um uh show you my my custom brushes yes all right. Eventually, I've got all these brushes that I made. I need to put them up on Flip Normals. I used to to work with um, the guys that run Flip Normals, and they're like super cool. So if you guys happen to see this at some point, miss ya. Um, so I got I've got all these brushes that I make, and all this shit that I make, and I oh I should all this stuff that I make, and uh, I should just probably put it up. But it's just a matter of like when I go to put start to put it off, I'm just like, oh, it could be better. It could be better. It could be better. Because you don't want to, you know, like it takes me forever. Like, you know, my, my, my Nomen videos, the 20 hours, most of those chapters I record two or three times. Because I'll record a chapter and if it's not perfect, I'm like, I got to record that again. So that took probably 60 hours to record because everything was done at least twice. So it's like I'm a little weird about putting something out there with my name on it if it's not perfect or as close to perfect as possible. And I've often said, too, another thing, too, and I tell my students this, and I think it's important, and I haven't talked about this an enormous amount until recently because it, occur it occurred to me that it might be useful for people to hear. I think a lot of people look at people that um, are working, and a lot of people uh, are their instructors or people that have, you know, they're in, in the industry in some capacity, and they might think that person is always pretty happy with what they've done. I have never liked anything I've made for more than 24 hours. I have got this to the point that I got it last night. Woke up this morning, opened up my renders. I am still happy with what I've done, and I'm still confident in my skill set, but I only ever see, the first thing I see is everything I want to change. So a lot of times when you're first starting out, that's overwhelming. Like if you're starting out as an artist, you don't see a lot that you're like, yeah, yeah. All you see is what you want to change. But that stays. That should, by all rights, stay throughout your career. And that's a good thing because that makes you focused on what you want to be better at instead of like just thinking you're awesome. And every really good artist I know, every single one, hasn't kicked back all the time and gone, I'm amazing. They're like, I could be better at this particular thing. Or, mm, gosh, I wish I could revisit that. And I think that's a really good thing. I think that's that's and it's also a good thing for those of you that are new to understand that if you feel that um, that sense of when you look at your work, you're just like, oh, God, there's so many things I want to fix. Well, that's that's good. And that'll stay. And what happens is you have aha moments and, and, and these these crescendos where you figure something out because it, it works by accident because you've been absorbing so much media or absorbing so many tutorials or whatever or absorbing classes and then it works and then you internalize that lesson and it's on to the next one and the next thing you know you've got 50 60 70 80 200 of those little lessons that you've you've learned that you've you've internalized and you just keep going but the important thing that I just wanted to get across is like I think you know pretty consistently a lot of the most the like, most impressive artists I've known none of them have been like super resting on their laurels or happy with their their themselves they always want to keep working and changing things um <clears throat> so uh, my paint brushes so let's say for example I wanted to paint down into these sort of recesses here which is what I'm doing so 
sorry, I'm just looking at the questions. How much time would you give on a personal piece and the same piece of working commercially? Yeah, Johannes Itten, uh, the Itten variations. I still have my Itten variations that I had to paint in gouache when I was in school. Um, the little squares of color that we painted. Uh, Hit Parrot Pratty, how much would you give on a personal piece? Um, I have a really short attention span. <laughs> so it works out really nicely for me to do um, concept work because it's like, there's only so much time you can actually spend on it. Um, I don't I don't like being stuck on something for a long, long, long time. Um, so, I mean, I don't know, probably, it sort of depends. I mean, I'll stay on something as long as it needs to to be, I be on, I need to be on it until it's at a, at a, at a point that's okay, that's good. Um, like uh, doing doing a concept at work, you've got like maybe at the max two or three days to do something worked up. But usually, I do something in a day to a day and a half, two days. That's from from sculpt to painted image. Um, <clears throat> Dosh doctor, so it's good to be a perfectionist, is what we're saying. Well. I don't know if it's about being perfectionist. It's just about understanding that you're probably never going to get to the point where you're just like, I'm awesome. It may not happen. And it, sh it maybe shouldn't be the goal that um, I, f I felt pretty empowered realizing that the people that I looked up to and still look up to, um, they don't, they don't go through life that way. Um, it's the, um, yeah, you know, so just that sort of thing. But yeah, being a perfectionist is good. Uh, Nihalis, I see flaws in all my work. Yes, yeah, I it's, I can't remember who said it. I think Picasso said. I think I think it was Picasso said that that you don't finish. It. No, it was it was. An, uh, anyway, nothing's ever no work of art is finished. It's abandoned, and I feel like that. I feel like I abandon things. I don't ever feel like oh that's finished. Uh, and sometimes, and this harkens back to what I said at the very, very beginning of this stream, sometimes it's good to abandon things. Sometimes it's good to do a little short thing and do another little short thing. Because I think you learn more making a lot of little projects rather than going into one long project where you're just overworking the same mistakes. You're going to see your mistakes faster if you um, do a whole bunch of little projects. Um, yeah. Yeah, agreed. It's uh, that you can being a perfectionist can be hit or miss. All right, sorry. So getting back to this, so I go to my brush. I'm going to go to brush, uh, load brush, and I have a custom brush here called Cavity Paint Brush. Now this is a pretty nifty brush. What it does is, if I take a color, like um, if you want to sample a color off your canvas, by the way, just click and drag, and you can sample directly from the canvas. And I will grab, let's say, by the way, if you hold down the Alt key, it will sample the shaded pixel. If you let go of Alt, it samples the unshaded pixel. Um, I'm going to grab that right there. There we go. And then I'm going to bring that value down, saturation up, so it's very, very visible. And then I'm going to start painting here. And you see what this brush does. And I have it turned well up so you can see very clearly what it does. It only paints into the recessed areas. It's set up just to do that. It works out really nicely here on that, that nasty skin there. That's pretty cool. I mean, that's much more bold than I would, um, I would actually paint something. But I want it to show up very, very clearly as you're watching. So yeah, this is really, really, really handy. So, um, how do we do this? You can do this by cavity masking. If you go to the masking menu here, let's go to tool masking, mask by cavity, and then open the cavity profile. If you make this cavity profile just a straight line going up and down and mask by cavity, it will mask everything out and then you can do it with a mask. That's one way of doing it. Baking it into the brush, I think, can be a little bit easier um, and more fun. So the only problem is there's a little bug in this if you're on the Mac version. So I love the spray stroke with the dot alpha, but unfortunately that's not working right now. This is a little bug. So that alpha counteracts the cavity masking, even if you turn the A button off. So be aware of that. So you can't use this on the Mac version with an alpha, but on the PC version you should be fine. 
All I've done here is I've gone into auto masking and turned on cavity mask and opened the mask curve. So here you can see I've edited my masking curve and I've changed my mask cavity mask value. Now it's at 33.3. That's quite Masonic, isn't it? And let's go ahead and do it again. And now I'm painting on the high points. So it's like dry brushing, for example. Like maybe I want to do a, like a lighter, like a yellow ochre um, on the top of the, 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 the nasty bits of the face here. So I'll turn my brush size up and turn my RGB intensity down. The same thing that I said about sneaking up on form is true for me when I'm painting. I like to sneak up on painting too. I make my underpainting really bold, but I will be more subtle as I'm working my way up the layers. There we go. Look at that. It's only painting into the into the raised areas. And switch color. Let's grab that red again. And then go to my um, cavity mask. And let's turn this up even higher. We've turned it to 60. So let's find another area that's got little recesses in it. We'll come down here to the to the thighs. So if I paint into this now, it's really down there into the into the crevices. It's really pushed it. I've also done another one. Of the, oh, actually, no, that's on another hard drive that I disconnected. So you can get really specific with these. You can make um, a brush that only paints along the edge of a crack. You can make a brush that paints into the crack. You can make a brush that paints on the spaces between the cracks. And it's all down to whether this is a positive or negative value, how high or low it is, and the shape of your cavity uh, curve. And that's it. That's all there is to it. Um, last thing I want to do, because we are going to run out of time, um, so on this particular model, I have set a object scale. So what I'm going to do is I want to open it in Keyshot, and I just want to show you a couple things if you do transfer something over to Keyshot. The first thing is I'm going to use the Keyshot Scale Sender because this object has been scaled to work in ZBrush, but he's about six feet tall, I think, in um, actual units. So I am going to just make sure I don't have Keyshot open already. All right, cool. So I'm going to do, I'm going to open Keyshot. I like to open it ahead of time instead of letting the ZBrush bridge open it. I don't know why. I think I was having problems with it <clears throat> before. <clears throat> Excuse me, golly. Just talking myself hoarse. There we go. All right. So here's our key shot, and I'm going to bring this um, over here. Boop. I'm trying to get that to dock because I keep these windows over um, on other screens. So I'm going to go to window. Um, Dock windows. There we go. <clears throat> All right, now let's go back over here and we'll do Keyshot Scale Sender, Send Scaled Tool to Keyshot. Um, render, external render, Keyshot. There we go. Now, what it will do is it will rescale the figure and then ask me if the scale is correct and then send it over to ZBrush or send it over to Keyshot, pardon me. So there you go, it's asking me, is that scale correct? Six feet, yep. Those little extractions are what I use to make the, the body cavity goop. Um, we go back to Photoshop. this stuff in here, which as I was saying earlier, it's, if we zoom in, it's actually, let me make sure, let me turn touch on on my Cintiq. There we go. Um, some of this is sort of coming out of these, these bits, but I don't have the refraction quite right. And it's like sticking little gooey bits in between there. and Coming down like this, just want it to look like sort of pus or something, but it's, it's the, the, ref the refraction on it isn't quite right yet, but I'll revisit it before the uh, final image. And then there's the poly painting on the lungs. So they feel quite sickly. 
and the sort of veining I just put in there. I just wanted to to block in some veining, and then I would I would work on top of that um, in Photoshop. I have another render that has a much higher translucency, so I can mask it out. So I can mask that out and then paint in translucency where I want it. Uh, that's going to be particularly handy up here on the protein stalks. <clears throat> I also like to render instead of taking the time and effort to paint um, spec roughness maps, I just do a render where everything's shiny and do a render where everything's matte. And then I mask between them in Photoshop. Um, it's much, much easier because I'm going to want the enamel to be shiny, but I want there to be a real line of demarcation between the enamel and the root. Because uh, if you look at a skull, everybody go get the human skull that you keep around the house. I know you all have one. Um, and then you can see that often there's there's like you see the shininess of the enamel and then you see it become quite dull where the gum line covers because the enamel is there to protect what the gum line can't protect because the gum isn't covering the tooth there. So let's see, we should be back in key shot now. All right, so this is interesting. This is going to throw people often with key shot. Um, oftentimes the model comes in facing the wrong way. So what people will do is they'll be like, oh, and they'll rotate and be like, okay, cool. And then zoom in. <clears throat> so this is just a nice thing to keep in mind. Um, when you do this, you've just rotated 180 degrees around to the opposite side of your studio HDR. So I go to project, go to environment, and under my environment tab, there is a rotation under settings. There's rotation. So I will often just double check. I don't need to rotate that by 180 degrees. So there we go. Um, I wasn't looking when I did that. So let me just double, let me put that back to, there we go. There's that's zero and then 180. Yeah, that's better because then you see you've got more of a key coming from this angle over here. All right. Um, that's a that's one big thing when when it comes to sort of key shot uh, and ZBrush working together. Um, I'm just gonna scroll my notes down here. <clears throat> mm, but we did the Boolean nineteen. Uh, do, 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 do. Sorry, just a moment. I want to check my notebook. I spent my morning writing down everything I wanted to tell all of you. Scale transfer. Oh, dark interface. Um, I really do like working with a dark interface. And if you go into your preferences, you can darken your Keyshot interface. I think uh, neutral gray is much, much better when you're trying to sort of cite values and create a nice value range. I do the same thing in Photoshop. Um, also, when you're in Keyshot, you can change your CPU usage here. Uh, this is handy. Uh, a lot of times it defaults to being really high, and it can just just pummel your system. So I'll set that to 50%. Also, when I'm just getting something composed, I'll turn on performance mode because I don't need to see the translucency and the bells and whistles. I'll just do this while I'm trying to position the camera. I'll go to my camera tab. I'll duplicate the free camera like this, and I'll lock it. Now, every time I come back with stuff from ZBrush, it's not going to get rid of my camera anymore. My camera is always going to be locked in to the object. Um, portrait and landscape, we don't really need to talk about that. 16.9. Cool. Um, <clears throat> materials. This is another big one. This is kind of a gotcha that I, I found is really useful. A lot of times people run into this uh, if they're using Keyshot. I'm not going to spend too much time in Keyshot because it's a, it's a ZBrush live stream, but there is the ZBrush to Keyshot bridge, so it's worth talking about. If we just go to the translucent materials and just grab human skin one, for example, hold down the Alt key, drop it on here. It's going to uh, preserve the poly paint. And I'm going to go to Edit, Set Scene Units, make them feet. Click OK. Continue. There we go. Now I'm going to go to my environment. I'll just go to an interior environment. And I like this storehouse. Go 
go to project, environment, set this to zero because that brightest light I think is actually behind the character. There we go, that's where I want that to be. All right, so now like the material is like, mm, okay, let's take a look at it. We'll double click it. Um, our translucency is set to 0.5 feet. Our roughness, he's awfully shiny, so we could turn that up. And then uh, if you turn the refractive index up, it becomes shinier, turn it down. Usually the default is quite good for the this translucency of skin. I'll go to my environment again, and I just want to brighten it a little bit before I show this. Cool. All right, so the skin is like, Ugh, that doesn't quite look right. This is sort of hidden. If you go into your textures for the material, you'll see that it's reading um, an EXR that's been exported from ZBrush for the poly paint, and it's set to Texture Map Legacy. If you upgrade to the new node and then turn off Matte Cap, Bang, there you go. This to me is a lot, lot, lot easier to work with. What are you doing? So Tun, Tun K is asking, what are you doing? I don't know what that, maybe if you could ask more specifically. Um, so this is much, much easier for me to work with now. I mean, that I, I see my poly paint and I can go back to my properties here and then I can change the, the translucency. If I want it to be super translucent, we set it to one and it's gonna be quite a bit more translucent. Um, I don't know. Sometimes I, you can set this stuff to ridiculous levels uh, and get nice effects, but let's zoom into this. Oh, I locked my camera, so I'll go to camera. <clears throat> and unlock that and then zoom in and you can see that we get a much 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 better oh that's nasty looking uh, we get a much better effect like that so that's a nice trick if you are using Keyshot uh, with the Keyshot ZBrush bridge that's a nice way to get your poly paint as you see it uh, over into ZBrush this is really nice that ZBrush has the matte cap that they're using uh, in the bridge but for skin for translucent stuff it just doesn't seem to work um, as nicely for me as when I turn it off. Um, <clears throat> so cool. And we started at three, four, five. Okay, cool. Um, we did sending to key shot. We did the custom brushes. We did matchmaker and the 19 Boolean. Um, I'm just looking at my notes, the things that I wanted to talk to you about. The, the hands. Cool, cool, cool. All right, well, um, does anybody have any other questions they want to pop into the chat with? So I'm starting to get a bit hoarse, so I might end it shortly because I think I've covered most of the stuff I wanted to talk about. And what I will do is I will take this one here, I'll finish this up posted up on ZBrush Central along with um, links to all three of these streams. So you can watch all three streams and pretty much see the whole process unfold. Because I went into this with some thumbnails that I, I sketched in my sketchbook. Um, and um, and I talk about those in the first session. So it's like you see the, the ideas develop. And I only worked on it off camera uh, like last night and um, a couple days before, I think. I did some work on the hands. So it's like most of it is actually during the stream. Um, Another thing that I do talk about in the first class too is like sketchbooks. Best advice for sketchbook, best advice for sketching in ZBrush, anything. Don't do don't do everything you do thinking about having to show it. Because the best way to keep a sketchbook and keep it consistent is imagine no one ever sees it. Like sketchbooks should be for you and they should be for um, making bad drawings. If you feel empowered to do bad drawings in your sketchbook, you'll 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 feel a lot better and then you'll do more work in it. You'll play in it more often. Uh, same thing with ZBrush. Just play in ZBrush. Don't stress about it being good because you'll get there. Things will get better. It's just a law of the universe. If you keep doing something, you're going to get better at it. So do you use Unif Unify when you import from other programs? Um, no, no, if I'm importing from another program, uh, I'll use the, the Scale Master plugin 
to store the scale. Sometimes it'll ask to unify, uh, and I'll let it. I'm always real paranoid about trying to keep scale consistent. So then it just worries me. Luckily, I don't usually have to worry about it, but um, there are times it'll ask me to unify, and I'll let it unify. <clears throat> Something to watch after Maddie is done with her stream. The ZBrush 2021 video. Thank you so much, Danny. I appreciate that. Dosh Doctor, thank you. Thank you so much. It's really, I'm really pleased that, that you know, people found something useful in this and I could share some information that was useful. I'm really, um, really serious about like being accessible like if you have questions send me an email like um friend me on facebook friend me on on um on instagram um hit my art station blog follow that and if you ever have a problem or have a question you can always reach out and i'd love to see what everybody's doing so <clears throat> doug thank you Oh, thanks. I appreciate that. Yeah, I do. I go on tangents a lot. It's kind of like it sort of de defines my classes where I always cover the material that I'm there to cover. But it always ends up with a little tangent with another uh, unrelated demo that just happens to uh, pop up because of what we're all talking about. Um, by the way, when you're doing your renders in um, Keyshot, it does give you these nice handy little passes like the clown pass here which allows you to very, very easily just magic wand select specific areas. So if I select clown, I can grab just the body, I can grab the ribs, uh, I can grab the um, um, lungs, but for something like that, I would probably have to go to select by uh, color because the, those islands are all broken up. And of course, it gives you a separate ambient occlusion pass, which is pretty handy. And a shadow pass. Uh, the the ground plane is in there, so I, I should have actually rendered it without that. Refle reflections, which is really nice for getting that rim light, because I'll punch that up in um, in uh, Photoshop and try and do a little bloom uh, around the edges. Um, I never really use this pass, and the diffuse pass isn't really very handy for me. And then there's my my RGB render. Uh, and the super translucent one. So yeah, and um, cool, cool, awesome. Thank you, Scott. You're welcome. So uh, thanks for watching, everybody. And um, I I always enjoy doing these. And and um, this is the third part of three. And like I said, I'll finish this off, uh, finish the, the image off in terms of presentation and put it up on ZBrush Central with links so you can go see. Oh, uh, there's another siren going by. There we go. Um, so you can watch the whole evolution um, as it goes along. So, um, sorry, just looking at the chat box. Render passes can be tweaked, compositing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Remnant from the Ashes. I'm not familiar with that. Although I did think that the, the left hand was totally like black metal hands. It's like, <laughs> looks like, uh, like King Diamond or something. I don't know. It's just like, <laughs> it's just really funny. I, 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 I tickled myself the other day when I was working on it. I was like, hey, that's like metal. Um, but, uh, what was I saying? Um, yeah, so um, uh, check out my art station. Check out my blog. Um, if you want to take classes, I do them at Nomen. If you want to watch my videos, you can find them at uh, Nomen Online or Nomen Workshop. And I've got some stuff on YouTube. And um, and if you ever want to reach out, you can find me online. I'm pretty easy to get a hold of. And um, so thanks, thanks so much for watching. Thanks for your support and uh, and your interest. It's uh it's always been a pl it's been always a pleasure to do these. So it's a really nice way to spend a Saturday afternoon. So I'm gonna head off because uh, I need to drink some more iced coffee and give my voice a rest. But um, thank you all again. Happy ZBrushing and enjoy making uh amazing things. Just keep doing it because you love it. Thanks, you guys. <laughs>